This is Malika Hook from the University of Colorado, and the topic today is selective laser trabeculoplasty tips and tricks. We'll discuss an introduction very briefly and then get into mechanism of action. We'll have some thoughts on clinical practice and briefly discuss select studies, and then we'll finish up with some brief closing thoughts. Various lasers have been used to lower intraocular pressure, including early on what was called goniopuncture, basically placing holes in the trabecular meshwork to connect the anterior chamber with the canal of Schlem. This was followed by argon laser trabeculoplasty, which was developed in the late 1970s. And this was thought to be a trabecular tightening procedure where the area of trabecular meshwork exposed to the thermal energy contracted, and that led to opening of the area's uh, within the trabecular meshwork surrounding the thermally damaged trabecular meshwork. The glaucoma laser trial established that ALT is non-inferior to topical medications. After ALT came SLT, which is selective laser trabeculoplasty. This was invented in the mid-1990s by Mark Latina. SLT uses a Q-switch double-frequency NDEAG laser at a wavelength of 532 nanometers. Q-switching refers to producing a high-intensity beam and short pulses. The laser itself uses 400 micron spots, which covers the anterior posterior span of the trabecular meshwork, and the pulse duration is very short at 3 nanoseconds. The initial cell culture work done by Latina and Park showed that there is selective cytotoxicity to pigmented TM cells at the short pulse durations used, and the short duration of each SLT laser is reported to be non-destructive since it's shorter than the tissue's thermal relaxation time. Like many things in ophthalmology, we're not quite sure what the mechanism of action is. In this case, there are three different thoughts. The first is mechanical, that thermal energy results in collagen shrinkage and tissue contraction, which leads to mechanical stretching of the surrounding uveoscleral tissue and widening of Schlem's canal, like I discussed in an earlier slide. This applies mostly to ALT. Biologic, upregulation of various cytokines, including IL-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, which leads to recruitment of macrophages into the trabecular meshwork and upregulation of matrix metalloproteinase expression with subsequent remodeling of extracellular matrix and increased aqueous outflow. This applies to both ALT and SLT. And then there's the thought of repopulation where laser energy stimulates increased cell division and trabecular metric repopulation. The new cells were found to repopulate the burn sites where aqueous filtration occurs in one study. This applies to ALT and it might actually apply to SLT too, but again, we're not sure about any one of these three different ideas. And it might be that more than one factor is at play. Kramer and Noecker initially reported a histologic comparison of ALT and SLT in human autopsy eyes. With scanning electron microscopy, they showed crater-like destruction with ALT and no visible damage with SLT. Transmission electron microscopy showed disrupted trabecular sheets after ALT, but not the case with SLT. This is just a photo giving you an idea of what it looks like on SEM of trabecular meshwork tissue treated with ALT. This is the crater with wide destruction in the area where energy was exposed to the trabecular meshwork. This is SLT, and essentially this is normal trabecular meshwork. There's really no site of damage in the report by Noecker and Kramer. Um, you would expect normal trabecular meshwork to look exactly like this. We completed a similar study here at the University of Colorado where we looked at corneoscleral rims from human cadaver eyes and exposed the tissue to both SLT and ALT. TEM, this is transmission electron microscopy post-SLT, showed that all powers resulted in disrupted TM cells with cracked and extracellular pigment granules. Samples treated at high powers revealed tissue destruction with scrolling of the trabecular beams. ALT-treated tissue showed increasing destruction with exposure to higher power. And the presence or absence of champagne bubbles during SLT did not alter the histologic findings. And this was one of the major findings in our study that using champagne bubbles to dictate the energy of SLT wasn't really valid given our findings. And, and I'll have more thoughts on that here in a little bit. This is just some of the tissue from our study. This is what control looks like. This is on scanning electron microscopy. ALT, we showed similar destruction to what was found in the Kramer and Noecker study. However, on SLT-SEM, we were able to show that there was still some destruction that happened at higher energy with scrolling of trabecular meshwork, and in some cases, wide destruction in the area that the power was applied. Our study conclusions were that ALT-treated tissue showed significant damage. SLT-treated tissue also showed disruption of trabecular meshwork with extracellular and cracked pigment granules, and there's no significant difference in the appearance of SLT-treated TM when treatment was titrated according to champagne bubbles. So a little bit repetitive here, but just to point out that 
using champagne bubbles for the clinical endpoint, as most clinicians have been taught to do, probably isn't relevant and, and shouldn't be used. SLT in clinical practice, the indications for use include ocular hypertension, primary open angle glaucoma, low tension glaucoma, and pigmentary as well as pseudoxfoliation glaucoma. Contraindications for use include narrow angles where you can't see the trabecular meshwork, chronic angle closure glaucoma with peripheral anterior synechia covering the trabecular meshwork, you know, vascular glaucoma, glaucoma secondary to inflammation, and traumatic glaucoma with angle recession. Basic practice in our facility, the patients check in at the front desk. You can do this in the clinic, or you can also do this in ASC, depending on your specific practice. Work up by the technician, followed by marking of VI, which is extremely important, and I'll go over that in a little bit. The patient is then consented, and drops are placed with propericane, and in our case, we use both pilocarpine to constrict the pupil and an alpha agonist to control the pressure postoperatively. We tend to use both. Some practices use one or the other, and the alpha agonists are commonly used. The patient is then seated outside of the laser room. And again, just a, a couple of points here about the marking of the eye. To avoid mistakes, we use blue ink and we place a very large X with the initials of the person doing the marking over the eye that we intend to treat. The patient must also declare which eye is being treated prior to moving forward. And we typically have a technician or a nurse in the room who's also doing a timeout with us before conducting the laser. We treat this very much like we treat any surgical procedure in the operating room, and we have overlapping safety measures to make sure that we're treating the correct eye. From a consent standpoint, we cover the following questions. Why are we doing the procedure? Which eye are we treating? What to expect with success or failure? What happens with a repeat procedure if one were needed? And we discuss persistent inflammation and change in refraction, both of which have been reported with SLT, although both are very uncommon. We have a file cabinet in the laser room that contains the uh, various lenses that we use for the different procedures. We also have a box of marking pens, and we keep all of our drops in a container that includes propericane, pilocarpine, alpha agonist, beta blocker. Uh, we also have some genteel ointment that we keep in place, so we don't just use goniosol uh, from time to time. We'll use genteel. It really depends on the uh, physician who's doing the treatment. This is a very typical laser. I'm not going to go through all the specifics because we have multiple lasers on the market and they differ slightly between devices. There are similarities, however. In our case, the physician will sit on this side, the patient will sit on this side, keeping in mind that there are wheels on the chair. So we make sure to scoot back the chair and lock it as the patient is sitting down. The patient then can hold on to these handlebars here to make sure that they're comfortable. The forehead goes on the forehead rest, and of course, the chin goes on the chin rest. We always have the technician prepare the room by placing the various lenses for us, depending on which laser we're going to do. This is an iridectomy, iridotomy lens, and I'll show you a little bit what we use for SLT. And again, the genteel that we might use. It's really important to know the control panels. In this case, we can do both the ag capsulotomy and SLT with this laser. So you have to be very familiar with the settings prior to getting started. This is the Latina lens that we use. It's a single mirror lens that allows us to see the angle by moving it around 360 degrees while we're doing the treatment. Very comfortable to hold and also comfortable for the patient once it's placed over the eye. Again, just a little bit of a close-up to the particular laser that we use. Um, the joystick is very familiar to what we're used to with a slit lamp. The activation button is at the top. There are various knobs on the device that can be used for increasing magnification as well as altering the laser light intensity. Uh, there's also the capability to do an offset depending on what type of laser you're doing at the time. Again, all of the lasers are slightly different, so just make sure you're very familiar with the different knobs on each one of the lasers that you might be using. We typically do 360 degrees. The caveat here is for pigment dispersion and pseudoxfoliation. We still do 360 degrees, but we always start off on a very low energy setting because of the increased pigmentation of the angle and not wanting to get the IOP spikes that can occur with heavily pigmented angles. Some people choose to do 180 degrees in the case of heavily pigmented angles, and there's really no wrong or right in this case. We just choose to do 360 degrees. We place 100 non-overlapping spots. Typically, I start off at 0.4 millijoules and I stay at that energy. In some cases, with a very low pigmented trabecular meshwork, I might go higher. You can tilt the lens in the direction of targeted angle to enhance visualization when needed. 
Rinse the eye when done. Gentile is more comfortable than goniosol, but for both, many of the patients prefer to have it rinsed out. And we check the pressure 60 minutes later to make sure that there's no IOP spike, which we define as more than five millimeters of mercury from the baseline pretreatment IOP. It's actually pretty difficult to get video of SLT treatments. I wanted to get a video of champagne bubbles because I'm frequently asked by our residents, what do you exactly mean by champagne bubbles? What does it look like? And you can see these bubbles that are forming here. That's essentially what you're seeing when you're asking for a, an endpoint of champagne bubbles. What I will say here is that when you, when you see bubbles like this, you're actually using too much energy. So you wanna back off to the point where you're barely seeing bubble formation at the surface of the trabecular meshwork or really not seeing any champagne bubbles or bubble formation at all. So you can go up to this point, but always dial back and don't do the entire treatment where you're getting champagne bubbles that appear like this. After the procedure, you can use artificial tears, steroid or NSAIDs, and we'll get into this a little bit more with a couple of studies that looked at the effect of different post-operative drops on the overall efficacy of the procedure. It's okay to stop the medications and observe the effect depending on the severity of the glaucoma and how worried you are about the level of intraocular pressure post-treatment. Recheck IOP four to six weeks later so you can get an idea of what the treatment has actually done to intraocular pressure. And there is a question about retreatment early. This is something we learned from the LIGHT study, which I'll mention here in subsequent slides. You can expect about a 25% IOP lowering in 65% of patients. Observations and potential complications. You can see AC inflammation in 50 to 83% of cases. This appears within an hour and usually resolves by 24 hours. Ocular discomfort has been reported in 15 to 39% of those treated. It's more common with ALT than SLT in our experience as well as in published literature. Pressure spikes greater than five millimeters of mercury can occur in 10 to 27% of treated eyes. This usually occurs less than two hours after treatment and it's usually easily controlled with medications. Just quickly to mention some studies, I'm not gonna go into these in great detail, but you can always look up these studies if you wanna learn more about each. Nagar et al looked at a group of patients prospectively and compared 90 versus 180 versus 360 degree treatment with SLT versus latanoprost. And what they found essentially is that 360 degree treatment resulted in more IOP lowering. They also noted more ocular pain with 360 and 180 versus 90 degree treatment. There's a lot of discussion about whether SLT and ALT are equivalent. I think this has been put to rest by multiple studies showing that there's really no difference in IOP lowering efficacy between the two treatments. We also know that SLT works better in pseudoexfoliation than it does in primary open angle glaucoma, although it is shorter lasting. There's a reaccumulation of the pseudoexfoliation material that subsequently plugs up the trabecular meshwork and pressure goes back up. However, in studies, it is very clear that initially SLT is very successful in pseudoexfoliation. SLT is also successful in normal tension glaucoma, although it is not as effective from a percentage IOP lowering as you would imagine. The higher the pressure in normal tension glaucoma or low tension glaucoma, the more IOP lowering you see. This is pretty standard for all treatments in glaucoma. And the conclusion here is that SLT is still effective in low tension glaucoma, although IOP reduction is limited. Repeat SLT. There are multiple studies that have looked at this question. Hong et al. looked at 44 open angle glaucoma eyes and found that the success rate for the second SLT is essentially equivalent to the first SLT with greater than 20% reduction. Timing of the second SLT did not matter, and there was a 2.3% rate of IOP spikes. Avery et al. looked at 42 patients with primary open angle glaucoma with repeat SLT and found that SLT initially is equivalent to a subsequent SLT. IOP reduction was around 4.5 millimeters of mercury with a success rate of 67%. The duration of effect was better for the second SLT at 7 months versus 13 months. Even SLT3 or a third SLT can be effective with IOP reduction of 3.6 millimeters of mercury and a success rate of 56%. Corey et al. looked at 51 glaucoma eyes who underwent a second round of SLT. The conclusion here is that SLT is not only repeatable, but may be more effective on repeat treatment. Two more studies here looking at the duration of effect, and just to mention very briefly, the average time to failure was two to three years. This is pretty consistent across different SLT studies. And of course, there's a big question now about what drop should we use for SLT. In this study, which was an RCT double mass trial, three treatment arms looking at prednisolone, ketorolac, and artificial tears for five days post-SLT found no difference in inflammation at one hour, two days, and one month. 
Self-trial conclusion is that short-term post-operative use of NSAIDs or steroid drops may improve IOP reduction after SLT compared to artificial tears, with maybe a slight benefit for the NSAIDs over the steroids and certainly over the artificial tears. Our practice is to use NSAIDs four times a day for four days post-SLT, mostly for patient comfort, as it appears that one versus the other, in other words, NSAID over steroid, doesn't really make that much of a difference. Certainly, patients tend to call more frequently with discomfort if all you're using is artificial tears or not using medications at all postoperatively. What about PGA use before or after SLT? The conclusion here is that the use of PGAs does not impact the success or inflammation post-SLT. Another lecture covers the light study. I would highly recommend listening to the one slide and five minutes lecture on this specific topic. One of the biggest findings, in my opinion, is that repeat SLT is quite successful. This was a follow-up to the initial light report, and it really changes the way that I think about doing retreatment for SLT. So if you combine the findings of the light study along with some of the other studies that I just mentioned, repeating SLT, even if the first one were only slightly effective, can be beneficial for the patient, even if done as short as two months after the initial treatment. I wanted to briefly mention this study, which is by my colleague Kaveh Mansouri. The conclusion of this study is that SLT achieved IOP lowering in a majority of patients with mild to moderate glaucoma. While it was inefficient in up to 35% of eyes, SLT success in the fellow eye was a strong predictive factor for success in the eye that was being treated. One of the most interesting things to me was the finding that males had more benefit compared to females in both qualified success and complete success. And the reasons for that are really unknown. Just a quick summary of the literature, average effect is around 20 to 30% as far as IOP reduction from SLT. The duration of effect is around two to three years. 360 degrees is more effective than 180 degrees. SLT is at least equivalent to ALT. It's effective in pseudoexfoliation glaucoma, low tension glaucoma, as well as eyes with prior ALT, which we didn't discuss. It appears to be repeatable. Please look at the light study report, which you can find on the same YouTube channel that this lecture is on. Postoperative drops don't really impact success that significantly. We tend to use NSAIDs because of the comfort for the patient, and PGA use is likely not to impact the treatment efficacy. The last couple of slides just touch on practice patterns and how to think about using SLT. I got this slide from Tony Riolini, who has really changed my thought process around using SLT in clinic. Some of the things that you should think about, there's freedom from daily responsibility to self-dose freedom from side effects of medical therapy, and freedom from the ongoing lifetime costs of medical therapy. SLT really wins across the board in this case. I also like this slide, which was adapted from Josh Stein, Archives of Ophthalmology 2012. If we're looking at the various factors that you see on the left-hand side, and then trying to figure out if SLT is more effective or if it makes more sense compared to a prostaglandin analog, which is our chief way of treating patients with monotherapy at the time of diagnosis, from an efficacy standpoint, SLT and a prostaglandin analog are about the same. From a safety standpoint, it's clear that SLT is safer than a prostaglandin analog. From an adherence standpoint, you have 100% adherence with SLT, and we certainly don't get that with a prostaglandin analog. The duration of efficacy for SLT is greater than that of our prostaglandin analog, and the cost in multiple studies has been shown to be better on the SLT side compared to a prostaglandin analog. So if you just look at this slide and the slide before, I think the argument for at least strongly suggesting SLT as primary therapy is something we should all be thinking about. I'd like to acknowledge my partners, Leonard Seibel, Jeffrey Suhu, Kaveh Mansouri, Mina Pancheva, and my friend Tony Riolini for some of the content that was presented here, and also for helping me understand the use of SLT better in my clinic. These are some suggested reading papers and chapters that you can consider looking at. And you can visit the SLT chapter in keogt.com at the link above. You can also look for this lecture as well as other lectures on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for your time.